Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right. So you, you have right. a nice range here from like uh, seventh, even some sixth graders. Wow. All the way up to high school seniors. Um, nice. When I look at this list, you know, there are about, well, about everybody in here is a, a really dedicated horn student. And uh, some of these cats I started um, in the, when they were babies, some of them I didn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, I mean, this is the best and brightest of my 60 member studio. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy up here in North Texas, man. They yeah, work, right, Texas, of course. <laughs> they work us, yeah. Yep. Well, anyways, wow. um, everybody, please welcome Daniel Kuhlman of the Seattle Symphony. Um, thank you for joining us. <laughs> I want to kick it to you right away and just let you kind of tell them uh, where you're from and where you work now. And if you want to talk a little bit about the Barbies, it might be a good time to do that too. Sure. And just go from there. I'll, I'll cool. just I'll take over. Yeah, I'll just give maybe like a brief um, synopsis of my musical life. So you kind of get, get an idea of who I am and where I've been and what I might have to offer today. Um, I actually grew up in Seattle. So I ended up back in my hometown, which is very, very fortunate for any classical musician, kind of like being a sports, um, professional sports player, right? Like, you don't know where you're going to end up, you just go wherever the job is. So um, I feel really lucky that I've ended up back here. Um, Seattle has a really good music education program. Everyone took, it's kind of like Texas, like everyone takes private lessons. Like that's not the way it is in most places, actually that other places I've lived at least. Um, but at least in these two places, um, everyone studies privately and there's a lot of opportunity for performance. So I was playing in bands and orchestras in sixth grade all the way through high school. Um, I knew pretty young, I'd say that I wanted to be a professional musician. I didn't really know what that entailed. I just, that's what I wanted. And I came from a really musical family. My brother actually went to Interlochen. Um, he's, if you were there with Leilani, you probably weren't there with him. Um, he was there just 01, 02, I think. Yeah, he's just um, slightly before me. Just a little before you, yeah. So um, he's only there student. for one year. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, he was there for two years. Um, he's now plays contra bassoon in the LA Philharmonic, so he's hey. fabulous. And uh, so, you know, I kind of just followed my brother up up the ranks of um, music. So I went to Juilliard for my undergrads and moved from Seattle to New York, big change. Um, then after Juilliard, I moved to Houston and went to Rice, another big culture change from New York to Houston. Uh, I stayed there for only a year and then I decided I wanted to go back to New York. So I, I didn't finish my master's, um, but I, Went back to New York and started freelancing. I freelanced in New York for, I think, six years after that. And wow. that was a really, really fun experience. Sometimes it was great. Sometimes it was not great. Um, the recession of 2008 to 11-ish happened right when I moved back to New York from Rice. And so I wasn't working a lot and that was really hard. It's a little bit, feels a little bit similar to what it feels like now where- A little triggering, so, right? Yeah, it's a little triggering. It reminds me a lot of that time. The only difference is I can't get together with my friends and play duets. So that's what I used to do back then. Um, and I started to get together with my friend Alana, who's actually playing acting third horn in New York Phil right now. Um, and Alana and I would play duets. And that was kind of the genesis of Genghis Barbie, which is the world's leading post-post-feminist, feminist, feminist all-female pop French horn experience. So we started that group kind of during that time when we had all this free time. So it was kind of like bittersweet, like none of us were working and that was really stressful, but we had all this time. So we actually had time to cultivate this group and this business that became Genghis Barbie. So um that was you like that was about if you'll give these because there's some really young ones in here will you give like oh, a yeah. really <laughs> dumb answer about what Genghis Barbie what is it is sure and what, and what the repertoire is yes so um you can you can find lots of Genghis Barbie videos if you go on YouTube GenghisBarbie.com or YouTube at Genghis Barbie um Facebook we're all there so Genghis Barbie is basically uh we were a group of four friends four young women in New York 
freelancing, decided to form a horn quartet that played only pop music covers. So we've branched a little off from there. You know, we've played the Schumann concert stuck and we've played a few originals and we've played some classical arrangements, but primarily we play pop music. So we'll play anything from Lady Gaga to Queen. Um, we've done Beyonce, um, Dolly Parton. Like we've kind of done a little bit of everything. So we try to keep it, um, we just play music that we love. So it doesn't really matter what genre it's from. Um, it's just, if we love a piece of music, we want to play it. So we kind of just, we gave ourselves the, the rule. The only rule of Genghis Farby is there are no rules. That's what we always say. So <laughs> when it was great because we got to form a group with friends um, and create whatever we wanted. And that was really freeing for us to be able to have a horn quartet where we could do whatever we felt like doing. But that also meant we had to do all the work to create um, you know, music for ourselves, to create tours and performances for ourselves, et cetera. So, um, and we've had a few different members along the way. So Leelani was with the Barbies for a few years, um, several years actually. And um, Jacqueline Adams, who's a Texas, North Texas native, she was our, the original uh, fourth member. Um, and so, yeah, we've had a lot of great Barbies over the years. And these days, you know, they all live in New York and I moved back to Seattle. So uh, we still exist, but we do mostly, you know, more projects around publishing. We recorded a new album last year and that was really cool. Uh, but it, that was really hard because, you know, that was me flying back and forth to record right. an album during my vacation time. So I didn't have any vacation last year. Um, you know, there's another horn player kind of in the, the, the market when you guys came out with the very first Genghis Barbie video and some of the first arrangements. I mean, I, I know I was like, oh, right. <laughs> There's this whole other world of music that we just don't even yeah. think is applicable to the horn. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that y'all are just a bunch of savage monster <laughs> horn players just Thank you. getting all around the instrument on those recordings. Yeah. I think that's what made it work because uh, when we, there was a lot of skepticism, of course, when we first came out. And um, I think it was important that we showed that, you know, other genres of music can be, can be just as worthwhile and just as like musically challenging. In fact, I mean, I would say, I think most of the Barbies would say that, that those shows are probably the hardest, some of the hardest things that we have ever done musically. Um, horn quartet is hard because you're always playing and well, the pop stuff, you know? yeah exactly like you have to cover sometimes you're covering the bass line and the harmony and the melody at the same time you're just like you don't get any breaths because in any gap you've got to fill in some other voice so yeah playing pop arrangements is really hard with, with the, needing the constant rhythm and the constant beat and pulse then that's really tough so but I love playing with Genghis Barbie we um, did the big international IHS, International Horn Society symposium last summer in Belgium. And that was really cool. Um, and our album came out last summer as well. So yeah, the Barbies, that was a big part of my life for a long time. And then I decided that I wanted to have a little more stability and maybe kind of really focus and shoot for the orchestra job that I kind of had always wanted. Um, and so I moved back to Seattle, um, in 2013 to kind of focus myself. Cause I thought, you know, there was some opportunity to be subbing in the orchestra in Seattle yeah. and I wanted to be able to focus on orchestral stuff and audition prep. So I moved back to Seattle, kind of, I was still freelancing a lot and traveling constantly, but I was taking lots of auditions and really focusing on audition preparations. I really kind of hunkered down into that. Um, we'll which I had done a for a nice while. moment to, to just talk about. We have many kids here that are about to take a few different auditions. Oh, good. Uh, Greater Dallas yeah. Youth Orchestra, mm -hmm. as well as placement auditions for their bands. Yep. When you say hunker down on audition <laughs> prep, how, how did that change from having to do consistent, you know, uh, uh, whether it's a church gig or, or Barbies, or I'm sure you were subbing with the Phil, 
you know, what's the difference in that preparation mm. versus the hunker down audition prep uh, for these students? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think it's probably a little different for everyone because it depends on what your strengths are. So it depends on what it is that you particularly need to work on. So for me, I was the kind of horn student who was very naturally gifted. Like I was a musical person um, playing the horn musically and playing the horn sort of na came naturally to me. So I didn't work on a lot of technical stuff. And then I got older and everyone else who had worked on their technique was better than me. And I got <laughs> passed over. And I, that was shocking to me because I had always just been kind of naturally good up into a point. And I always try to share this because I know there's people like that, um, lots of other students like that. And it was really hard for me to accept that I also had to work hard. Things weren't just going to fall into my lap. So for me, um, hunkering down and working on auditions was really about um, honing my consistency and the consistency of my playing um, because I was good. You know, I was a good horn player. I could sound great, but I couldn't always sound great. And I couldn't, I wasn't always consistent in how I sounded. And when you're playing an audition, um, I mean, I assume probably your auditions will probably be taped at this point, but um, yeah. so it's a little bit different, but, but even so you have to kind of be in performance mode, even when you're making a tape. So being in performance mode and being able to play at your best all the time is really what it means to sort of um, practice auditioning for me, for in, from my experience. I think for other people sometimes, um, actually what I'll say is it, I think for everybody, it's kind of just the mental work of playing. So not only just having great technique and working on your fundamental technique, but really working on the mental aspects of playing an instrument, which especially for horn players is a really big part of what we do. And the older I get and the more advanced I get in my career and in my playing, the more I realize how important that is. So that was, I think, what I was primarily working on was getting my head in the right place to do my best. Because usually we're the ones standing in our own way, <laughs> right? Like, okay, so this yeah. is um, just, you're just so, you're just making my life so easy <laughs> as an interviewer. Um, so as we just kind of go down the road here, you, you're saying that you're, you're working to get more consistent. Can you give us a few practice techniques that help you with developing a more consistent approach to the horn? Yes, definitely. So I spent a lot of years on the horn practicing music and kind of not really knowing how to practice, I would say. And that was a big struggle. So I'm sure I can guarantee there's people in this Zoom meeting right now who are, get frustrated when they practice. And that was me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. That was me for most of my horn playing life. There was a lot of frustration. Um, I was very confused about what a lot of things meant and sort of how to approach things. So I think especially for the younger players, it can be really hard to sometimes even know what to practice or how to practice. And often we play music. We just play through things and we we might, you know, pick a thing here and there and try to improve upon it, but we might not really know yet what to listen for and how to, um, how to really improve. So, so in that um, period of my life, when I was really focused on consistency, I really focused a lot on my fundamental horn playing exercises. These are the things that I didn't like doing when I was younger, like long tones and scales and for me, I do a lot of harmonic series slurs. And I mean, that, that's that, the path from, from Rice, right. of course. And that's all I do now. I mean, it's funny because I probably practice better and more now than I ever did, except maybe when I was at Rice when I really practiced a lot. Um, but I practice more now and I love it. I actually enjoy those exercises. And that's I don't really practice music barely ever because I don't need to. So when I was doing all this audition prep, I realized it was so much more important that I didn't have any holes in my playing because if you have things that you don't feel confident that you can do, you can't really get to that level to have the consistency to really excel kind of in the professional audition world or to just show your best, you know? 
uh, you have to really be honest about the things that you need to work on. And I, I think when I was younger, I was more focused on this piece, this audition piece, this concert, and less focused on my playing as a whole. And now I really look at my playing when I'm practicing. And, and at that time when I was, when I focused on how to become more consistent and um, more able to do well in auditions, um, that it really became more about my playing. So I would practice very few excerpts a day. So I would never like go through a bunch of stuff. Like if you just overwhelm yourself with, I have to practice all these things today. Um, you won't get the quality kind of work in. So I would, I would, because I would do that naturally, I made sure to sort of plan ahead. And I was like, okay, today I'm just practicing two excerpts. Like that's it. Or I'm just going to practice these five scales or less, maybe just two scales. And I'm going to practice this one piece. Like that's it. I'm going to practice these two lines and I'm not going to let myself go any further so that you really like allow yourself to focus on something and then you can take what you practice it's amazing I mean sometimes I have students come play for me and they have nothing and I'm like play me a C major scale and we can have a lesson for an hour like <laughs> you can learn so much and you can get so much out of very little material so you know if you pick an, a short excerpt maybe you have like a little piece of an etude for for a band audition or something and pick just a little part of it and play it and actually listening to yourself and actually addressing some of the issues that come up. And what I would do, my practice technique for that is to play something, listen to myself, you know, record yourself or listen very genuinely to yourself as it's happening and be honest about what's going on. So if something doesn't go right, instead of giving yourself that little out of like, well, it's usually fine. So even though it's probably not, um, then actually saying, okay, that wasn't what I wanted it to be. It wasn't wrong. It wasn't a mistake. It was just, it wasn't what I wanted, you know, what I conceptualized that to be. So it didn't have the most beautiful sound. Maybe I missed too many notes. Maybe it didn't feel secure. Uh, and I would go back and I would formulate my own exercises to fix those issues using sort of, you know, um, thinking about the exercises that I've gotten from teachers and books in the past, but I would kind of say, okay, well, what issue am I having? What exercise would help me to work on that issue? So for me, it was a lot, a lot of it was like low playing. I, it's funny because now I'm a low horn player. I play fourth horn now. Um, and I've had two low horn jobs, but it wasn't something that, that came naturally to me. So I worked on it a lot. So I would always struggle a lot with like articulation in the low range. So I would practice, I would formulate different exercises like playing low long tones so I could really get the muscle built up for holding those pitches steady. And I would experiment with my articulation and I would do repeated articulation exercises, lots of breath attacks. I do lots and lots of breath attacks um, to get my air moving the right way harmonic slurs to really feel the sort of shape, you know, of playing those different notes. And I would focus in on, you know, one note or two notes. But by doing that, I was actually improving the muscle memory so that when I went back into play this excerpt, I had actually made improvements rather than just maybe playing something a few times and thinking, I probably made that better, you know. Absolutely. So it was really, it was very focused. And I think that's harder to do when you're younger. But the earlier you can get any of that into your practice, the better. So just sort of like restraint almost is really helpful when you're trying to improve. I think for the young ones in here, you know, you hear her saying muscle memory a lot. Whether it's your audition music for you Frisco cats, you've got the body ba ba body dum. <laughs> that's difficult. And so what she's saying, and you've all heard me say it as well, is you take those very difficult parts, convert them into something that is memorized, and when you get there, you'll sail through it. Yeah. But there's no way to replace those reps, and that just rote repetition is, like Mr. Vermeulen yeah. says, um, the, sometimes the strongest medicine doesn't taste very good. Yes, that's so true. But the more, you know, the more that you understand the horn and the more that you understand why those exercises like why long tones are actually so good for your horn playing the more that they become I, I don't know if I would say fun but I enjoy doing those things more because I understand how they're benefiting me and I really 
yeah. saw the payoff of doing that work. And that's the most fun thing. So I always try to, to encourage students in that way because the most fun thing, like it's not fun to be bad. It's fun <laughs> to be good, right? It's way more fun to get better. And the better you get, the more fun you can have. That's so right. even if that takes hard work, it's always worth it. It's totally worth it. So yeah, I totally agree. And, and the muscle memory thing is so important. And for me, I like to do a lot of work sort of outside of the music, whatever, whatever the music is I'm working on. I try to sort of shift my brain out of that to, to uh, work on that muscle memory. It's both. I mean, I do both. So I'll sometimes, you know, I will focus on a certain arpeggio or harmonic series or, or scale that kind of pertains to what I need to work on and build the muscle memory just so I can get my brain into like exercise mode instead of music mode. So I really sort of, that, that sort of rote practice is my brain learns it better in that mode, I guess. And then what I'll do a lot as well is a lot of singing. So especially like some, the thing that you sang, that little passage, whatever that is, that's something I would absolutely be singing because the muscle memory is not only about your face. It's also about what's in your ear, like really in your ear, like, Sometimes I, I think I can sing something and then when I sing it, it's actually not accurate. But the thing I, that I noticed the most is when I would sing the opening of Ein Heldenleben. Some older students might know it, maybe younger too. It opens with a big horn moment. And every time I would sing it, I would just kind of go, ba -ba -da. and then I would realize like, I wasn't actually aware of the real steps and I was actually not even doing it in the right octave. So it's more like, ba -da -da. <laughs> like that's yeah. the actual so even something like that when I realized like in my head and in my ear and in my body I wasn't feeling all of those spaces in between the notes and all the relationships and and that is so important for horn to really really know your intervals like we have to study ear training we have to study music theory and we have to understand intervals like seconds thirds fourths fifths um we really need to more than any other instrument because we have to know those sounds and not only know them but feel them like when you do like i know i think it's the singer book that has like thirds fourths fifths all these extra like you have to know that's part of the muscle memory is just knowing what a fifth feels like as opposed to a whole step or like a half step sometimes i find the half steps are the parts we we know the least those little intervals you know so that's really important to, to really know them and be able to reproduce them in song with, is so important to really like deeply knowing a piece of music. And I really think that you can't truly be consistent until you deeply know every moment of the music that you're going to play, which sometimes means a lot of practicing because <laughs> sometimes there's a lot of music. Sometimes it's really hard. <laughs> so. we, we like Chantal for the interval work a lot. Mm. And mm -hmm. I make it buzz and sing and play Chantal with a drone. Um, Good. It's great. But again, kids, it's like for all of you that are here, y'all are my best and brightest. This is master class clinician number, what, seven or eight by now telling you to sing everything. <laughs> like how many yeah. times will we hear it from the best and the best? <laughs> Um, I want to get into the meat of why I asked you in particular to join us. Um, things like the inner game of tennis and uh, other mental aptitude ideas from whether it's sports or other parts of the marketplace are really important to me. One of the things I know about you is how strong of a mental game you've developed over the years. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about self-talk and the importance of not treating yourself like a jerk. Yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, just in general, I, I happen to know from David and, and from your previous talk with David, um, the level of mastery that you have over your own dialogue with yourself is something that I work each and every day on. In fact, it was my New Year's resolution a few years ago. Um, nice. <laughs> so anyways, I'll just let you go and, and yeah, no, that's great. And I mean, it's funny because I also work on it every day. Like it's not something that you really, it's a complete. practice. Yeah. It's a practice. And I think that I also like to, to think of horn playing that way as well. I mean, when I was younger, I definitely thought there was some kind of arrival point and that I would just like be done. 
but it's not like that. And, and part of playing an instrument and part of the joy and benefit of playing an instrument is that you're always practicing. It's sort of like practicing yoga. Like you're never just like a master of it. Like you practice every day and we're always working towards something, but there's no end goal. We're just kind of moving on our journey. So to me, that, that is a big part of it. Just sort of like realizing that you're never going to feel like you're done. And that is really important because sometimes if we don't feel that, we feel like maybe we're missing something or we're failing, but really that's just how everyone, I mean, Dave, David Cooper is like probably the best horn player, one of the top in the whole wide world. And, you know, he's still practicing every day and trying to improve himself every day. Um, and in his, in my interview with him, I think I mentioned this, that when I was a, a student at Juilliard, I heard someone told me that Joe Alessi, who's the principal trombone of the New York Phil, that he practiced like three hours a day. And I was like, what? Why? Like, why does he practice? <laughs> He's in the New York Phil. And now I just find that so laughable. But I just didn't really understand, you know, how it worked. Um, well, there is no mountaintop. You know, David is, yeah, taught me no. that. After he yeah. won Berlin, you hear him and you're like, well, can't get any better than that. Yeah, but, exactly. But now, you can get a lot better. It, yeah. He's crazy now. Like He's still doing it. And, and even if you sort of are at the best of your ability, whatever that means, you, it still takes work just to stay there. And as you get older, I mean, I'm in, only in my 30s, but even so, I'm already starting to notice how things change from being young as you age. So even, uh, even just to keep my level where it is, I have to work hard every day, let alone get better, which of course I'm always looking for things to improve and uh, ways to improve. But um, yeah, the, the mental part of horn playing is so important. And I really like to share as much as I can about my own experiences and struggles with that, because I know that when you're young and when you're a student, sometimes that can really eclipse the positive parts of your playing. Like we tend to be really competitive. Um, and, you know, some of that is the fault of the system. Like school systems and sometimes even these auditions and things give us sort of these false ideas that we should be somewhere, we should be able to do something at some time. But that's really not how it works. Like we are where we are when we are and that's fine and that's great and there's no place that anyone should be and we're all inevitably going to be at different places at any given time so um i have i work very hard still to kind of take a less judgmental approach to myself but also to the people around me i think we sort of develop through competition things um a tendency to judge and critique other people. Of course, no one as harshly as we judge ourselves, but we tend to do that. And I think it's really important to, to support the people around you and the people in your studio and your colleagues and, and the people who are struggling and the people who are excelling. Like, it's great to just support each other. If, if when in doubt, always read the opening page of the Philip Farkas Art of Horn Playing book where he talks about sort of this kinship of horn players. Like, we're all doing it. We're all working at it and we're all trying uh, to understand this thing and and so we have kind of like a family of horn players and we need each other's support um, to succeed and so I think a, a big part of what I've learned is really to give myself a lot of grace when it comes to things that I'm working on because I think a lot of musicians tend to be perhaps a little perfectionist and there may be some perfectionism in there. There usually is. Um, and that's really hard for horn players because we're probably the least perfect of all the instruments. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, we can't be perfect. No one's perfect. No horn player plays a concert without missing a note. I guarantee that I've heard everyone, I've heard all the best people. Nobody plays perfectly. Sometimes you think they did. You sound a certain way, but nobody plays perfectly um and we're all because we're human you know and that's part of it so i've tried to really shift my priorities from um playing in a way where either i'm like perfect or no one can 
judge me for something I did. I don't know if that makes sense, but playing it safe, I guess, in a way yeah. to really thinking like, well, what do I want to do here? And what am I, where am I today? Where, where am I in relation to the music I'm performing or working on? And whatever that is, is, is the best you can do. Like you, that's all there is, you know? And, and I think if we focused a little more on our individual contributions and what we have to offer, that we would really have a lot more interesting music and more vibrant communication as well. So that's one part of it. I think just sort of understanding that like everyone feels frustrated and everyone feels nervous and afraid and everyone worries what other people are thinking about them, including me. I, I talk the talk, but I, this is how I feel every day when I go to work and I'm a professional horn player and everyone around me is feeling the same thing. It's right. kind of funny. It's like, what if, what if we all just stopped worrying about that? Like then what would happen? Um, but that's part of being human. Like it's hard. And so we have to work on that by really kind of allowing ourselves some wiggle room to, to work on things and to struggle. Even when you're at your best, like one day is not going to be as good as the next. And that, even that can be hard. It's, you can never be perfectly consistent. Um, you can work as best as you can to be as consistent as possible and to, to figure ways to um, get through those day-to-day -day struggles. And I do that through my fundamental practice and making sure I'm really focused on the core of my horn playing ability and that I'm always taking care of myself, like um, getting enough sleep, trying to eat decently and keeping my body relatively healthy and uh, making sure I'm resting, especially resting your chops, very important. Like making sure that I'm taking care of my mouth muscles is very important. Um, that's, a, that's a part of it. I think the other part of sort of self-talk, and I actually didn't really talk about this in my interview with David, and I really wish that I had. Um, Perfect. Well, yeah, here we are. So you'll get the gold. <laughs> so one of the most important things that I, that I ever did was before I took the audition in Seattle, um, I, which was very stressful because this was like me auditioning for my hometown orchestra. Yeah. My, my boyfriend actually was like living here already and I was living in California. So it was like, I really wanted this job so I could <laughs> stay with my boyfriend. Yeah. Uh, hometown orchestra, dream job. You know, it was like, there's a lot of pressure, right? Um, and I could be the best person and still not, you know, do my best or still not even get the job. So it was a lot of mental stress around that audition. So I was doing a lot of negative self-talk before that, like a lot of like, oh, I hate auditions. I'm so nervous. There's so much pressure for this. Uh, you know, this, this is terrible, you know, but a lot of that and sort of like, I'm really struggling right. with this. I can't do this. What if I can't do that? Um, and someone, I was actually in Houston and there was this random violist who was staying with my friend I was staying with. And he was like, you know, I'm just going to point out to you that everything that you're saying about this audition is really negative. And like, there's no way that's going to help you. And I was like kind of taken aback by it, but I thought, <laughs> okay, like he may have a point here. And I really tried to, I actively practiced adjusting my inner self-talk. So not only how I talked about that experience outwardly when I would talk to other people about it, I literally just started like lying about it. I was like, I'm so excited about this wonderful opportunity that I have. And I mean, that was the truth. It was an, a very exciting opportunity. I wasn't actually excited about it, but I, I started saying that out loud to people. I stopped saying I was nervous. I stopped saying I didn't like auditions. I was like, I love auditioning. It's going to be great. Fake it um, till you make it. <laughs> fake it till you make it. But what was amazing was I also really worked on my inner talk. And that I think was the most important part was that I stopped berating myself when I was practicing. If something didn't go the way I wanted, I stopped kind of like being upset at myself and saying, like being frustrated, like, oh, why can't I do that? Or why do I keep missing that thing? Why didn't I work harder on that? Or, oh my God, I don't have enough time to fix this. I started, if I, if I heard that in my head, I was like, no, that's not helpful to me. I'm going to flip it around into something productive. So instead of oh my God, I keep missing that every time. I would be like, this is a, 
this is an exciting opportunity for me to improve something. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, like, right. oh, I, I have something to work on. And I have, and I have time, you know? I was like probably literally like three weeks out of the audition at that time. But I was like, I have time. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't allow myself to think those negative things. Of course they kept coming. It's not like, it's not like they disappeared. And that's forever, you know, I think for a lot of, for most people. Um, but the more that I practiced that, the more it became natural for me to rephrase what I was saying to myself. And I wish so much that I had had this skill earlier in my life so much because it was amazing how it changed the experience for me, even though it started with me being really skeptical and like feeling like I was lying about it. Um, it not in not that much time, it, it felt more natural and it felt more positive. Like that was what I was practicing before I was practicing negative stuff wow. and I was reinforcing it. And now I'm practicing and reinforcing positive messaging. And it doesn't mean I'm walking around being like, I sound amazing all the time. It was just about making something productive. It doesn't help to be angry at yourself for something that's not going the way you want it to on the horn. Instead, I was really focusing on, okay, well, how can I shift this so that it's productive? So I'm supporting myself. And by the time I got to the audition day, I, I, I saw other people around me and the way that they were talking about the audition that was coming up. And it was very different from what I was saying. And I was like, it was so obvious to me. I could see the difference. And I was like, I know how you're going to do on this audition. And I know how I'm going to do. And yeah, I actually didn't end up winning that job. It's a long story, but that was the audition for Second Horn. Right. Jenna, for Second Horn, she got that job. And then, and then fourth opened and they gave me fourth. So I was runner up. It was like, you know, what um, you but, said, but it was a very big success. <laughs> what you just said is my mission statement for private lesson <laughs> teaching. If mm. I can get a 14 year old to learn that lesson, I could really care less about <laughs> their point of plan. Um, yeah. You no, know, I think, and, and, and I found myself getting a little choked up listening to you talk. Because <laughs> we've all been right there staring into the black yes. and not knowing how to get ourselves recollected. Uh, I find that gratitude is a really powerful emotion. My, the last audition I took before COVID, I made the finals in Oklahoma City, oh, which nice. was no higher. But I found in the same way you did, I found myself on that day just saying to myself like, man, what a sweet thing to just be sitting here playing Masterworks. <laughs> I'm not, I used to be a chef, so I'm, I'm, not, oh, I'm wow. not in the trenches in a kitchen. I'm not yeah. 90 degrees on my feet. I'm, I'm sitting here playing Mahler and Mozart yeah. and I should be so lucky. Yeah, yeah. And that's really important. And I think it's important even to just sort of, I mean, we're lucky to play the French horn. We're lucky to, to know that experience, you know? And sometimes it can be frustrating, but it's, that's, you know, most instruments have that sort of balance, like of payoff to struggle. Like, you know, it's cool to play the flute, like, but it's not like a super rewarding experience when you like play the flute well, <laughs> because, Everyone can play the flute. I used to play the flute. That's what. Um, but when you play the French horn, like it's so much work to do it, even just to do it, let alone doing it well. But like the payoff is so high. Like mm -hmm. the joy of playing that instrument. I mean, it's everyone's favorite instrument. We have all the best solos. We have all the best music. Like we understand like a certain depth of what it means to like work hard. And I feel very grateful for that. So even like when I get, when I got to that audition day, I wasn't like, I'm going to win this. Like I'm going to be the best. I was just like, I'm proud of the work I did. I feel good. Yeah. I, I feel good. Like I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I hope I get this job, but like it felt oh. really good. And that was a different feeling than other times when I felt like, I had failed, you know, if I didn't win. And it's like, most people are going home and not winning, you know, it's like, that's just how it is. Um, and so it would be a shame if everyone felt like they had failed, you know, it's like, we all have the opportunity to be working and improving ourselves and, and having that experience. So, I mean, and there's so many parallels that I've now drawn between that experience and like the rest of my life, like the way that I talk to myself, 
as a person or like in a, in a conflict situation or in a relationship or, or in any kind of struggle or something I'm struggling with. Like, it's kind of been a skill that I, I'm like, thankful. I'm so happy that random violas told me this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like changed my life, you know? Um, but it's true. It's like, there's, you can spin things different ways and there's not just one way of thinking about something and you have a lot of flexibility to kind of rebrand your your inner thought and it really can affect what you're able to do and how resilient you're able to be and how creative you're able to be how fulfilled you're able to be like with the same experiences you may have had but you feel them differently and experience them differently so i really am a big believer in the positive and constructive self-talk like and not in a way it's when I say positive self-talk it makes me think of like people being like I'm the best and everyone likes me Uh, it's but it's more just about the constructive way of how you talk to yourself even on the inside and that's the hardest thing is to really notice those things like notice the way you know and I this is also I think different for for women and you know, femme identifying people as it is for men. It's different for people of different races and people of different life experiences. Um, we all have different um, struggles with how we view ourselves and, and confidence and self-talk and internalized stuff, you know, and that's really something to consider, especially as a teacher. I think it's important too, to, to think about that. Um, and so even like, you know, as a woman, there's a lot of things that I notice, the way that I talk to myself and the way that I um, relate to even myself is um, a constant learning process, a constant struggle, but uh, it's always sort of with the goal of, you know, having a, the most fulfilled possible life experience I can. <laughs> what else but can it, I do? It really is. I, I talked about this with, uh, with some friends the other day, but That really is the American dream. I mean, my generation and yours, we're some of the first generation where we get to walk through life saying, how can I be most fulfilled every day of my life? I mean, my grandparents did not have that luxury. (laughs) And, you know, we have many of the students here are are first generation Americans and their parents Mm. immigrated here and they certainly did not have that luxury. Mm. Um, And and again, I, I think as you go back to gratitude, like, just the opportunity to be able to pick up this stupid instrument that you stick <laughs> yeah. your hand in and you yeah, it's like... <laughs> people feel things from a hundred feet away. I yeah. mean, it's, it's it unbelievable. Is a really special experience. Yeah, I'm constantly, sometimes I'm sitting on stage in the symphony and I just look down at the horn and I'm like, what is this? <laughs> like, what, are, what are we doing? And I, I love looking at all the different instruments and I'm like, how did we get here? Like, what is like, a bassoon like what is that Who, how did this happen and that somehow you know and but what's coming out and what we're feeling is so magical like I'm amazed that's another thing I think that I like to um, kind of bring up and talk about when I'm teaching or talking about horn is that like sometimes we think there's some like magic going on with the instrument but you have to just like look at the thing and, and realize like it's literally a tube <laughs> like it's a tube with some buttons on it like that's all there's nothing like the magic isn't in there like it's all in us and everything magical that comes out the other side of the horn is happening in here it's not happening anywhere from here out it's all happening in here and to me that helps me think about how i create sound and how i actually play the instrument technically Like if I want a certain note shape or a certain tone color or a certain phrasing, like it's all, I have to do it. Like there's not going to be any magical process when I wiggle my fingers on this piece of metal. Like there's nothing happening in there. It's weird. You know, I'm like looking at it because it's on the floor here, but yeah, it's a a funny instrument. You know, it's just a very abstract thing that sometimes we think there's more going on externally, but it's really all happening in us and all the resonance all the sound all the tone and phrasing it all comes from our body and that's why every horn player is unique and everyone's value is unique and different too when it comes to playing any instrument but it's a good thing to wow. remember. <laughs> Man, you are incredible i, we could, I could just I sit here and, and, and talk to you forever 
Um, guys, gals, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. I've already yeah. put the link to GingisBarbie.com there. Um, <laughs> Caroline asked um, if you ever ran into any copyright mm. issues with the Barbies. It's a good question. So we, since we play pop music, we do purchase licenses to record. We've purchased licenses to publish. Uh, arrangements we do there's some gray areas with some of this and it's a little confusing but we always make sure to stay on top of the legal stuff um our last album was all classical partially because we were like we need to just get some public domain <laughs> so clear. Like, <laughs> it's expensive to it's it really is. expensive to buy the rights to, to the music but we do it um I, end, I actually accidentally arranged a, something by Benjamin Britten, just thinking like classical music, not realizing that we oh, were little, still under copyright. Late. And we had oh. to pay, we had to pay for that. So that was my bad, but um, yeah, we make sure to stay on top of that. And you know, we asked a lot of, we didn't know any of this when we started. We just asked lots of questions. We reached out to lots of friends. I mean, it's amazing how much stuff your friends know <laughs> and just reaching out to people and asking and saying, hey, do you know anything about this? And we did a lot of Googling, <laughs> but we did. We asked a lot of friends. We have friends who are lawyers, accountants. Um, we just went to the bank and said, help us, tell us how to be a business. <laughs> how, we, how do we do that? You know, and we figured it all out. And it was a little bit of just sort of, I guess, um, courage into just allowing yourself to um, not know something and just opening yourself up to learning. It's a big part. That was a big part of that. Absolutely. I, that's, you know, so much of just to quickly touch on what we just talked about as well. You know, so much about what I learned with Mr. Vermeulen that I still learn. I still go down there every couple, every about twice a month once we get back to yeah. this. You know, just I'm going to be who I was yesterday, today. <laughs> and tomorrow I'm still going to be who I am. <laughs> and we, we get into that mindset of like, okay, today's the day. I'm going to be the best I've ever been. I'm going to be <laughs> that guy today. <laughs> but you're not. You're going to be who you were yesterday. You know, yeah. you're going to be 80% of your best, hopefully. Yeah, that's pretty. I actually, one of my favorite um, horn philosophy moments comes from Alana from Genghis Barbie, where someone asked her once about, I don't remember what the question was, but she basically, I think someone asked, like, how do you deal with it when you have a really bad performance or something? You know, we all do. Uh, <laughs> less and less, the better you get. That's why it's more fun to practice and get better but she said something along the lines of like she was like well like you might have a good day and then you might have a bad day and then that day is over <laughs> like yeah. and that's it you know it's like it, this too shall pass like yep. all you know it's like some days are good and some are bad I'm not gonna like dwell on one bad moment of course that's what we tend to do is Horn players is like, remember the one note. I remember so many specific notes I missed that I'm angry about. Oh. But it's like, you, know, you have to look at, at the perspective of it, of like, what about all the good moments? Like, why don't I focus? Like, why is it that I'm focusing on the thing I missed rather than focusing on that, that amazing connection I made with the audience or that beautiful phrase I played, you know? And so that's another shift you can make on your own is what is it that you're choosing to focus on? And that we are in control of that. We're not in control of, you know, we're not always in control of missing a note, but, but we can um, choose how it affects us and how it holds us back or how we move forward and up from there. So, yeah, yeah, we've all heard the classic line of, you know, you have to have that shooter's mentality as a horn player and always believing the next shot's going to go in. Yep. Even if you yes. miss a hundred in a row. <laughs> Absolutely. My, my best friend Kyle Sherman has a, uh, I don't know if you know him, he's a principal trumpet in the Fort Worth Symphony. Oh, okay. Uh, he has a sign on the exit to his practice room that says, trust no matter what, that you just got better. <laughs> nice. That's so good. And, you know, some, and that's good because sometimes you do have to trust because yeah. especially with a horn, like it's very slow progress sometimes and you have to believe that, you know, and you have to trust in the work you're doing, but that means you have to do the work also. <laughs> but it's true that sometimes we struggle, especially when we're younger, when you're not great yet, like you want to be great. Like I know, <laughs> you know, like we all want to be really great players. And sometimes it's really hard to believe that like you will get there, like you will improve. 
but there's no way to skip. There's no shortcuts on music. There's just none. And the that's a little hard to Exactly. Like exactly the, the hard the uncomfortable yes, truth. So true. The hard the hard the shortcut is the hard work. Yeah. And you know, but to but to know that you you will get there. And and every day that you work hard and improve, you're just getting that much closer to that fulfillment and greatness. So it's not like you just wait, 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 and then you feel it. Like you're you're getting closer to it and feeling more of it every day, every time you put that work in. So that is true. You really do have to sort of trust in that. I say a lot in my practice, trust the process, because yeah. sometimes we're really focused on getting a certain result, like getting a certain note to come out or getting a certain thing a certain way. But, but trusting in the process of how you're doing that work is so much more important. So trust the process is one of my mantras. Well, and this is why I try to get all these you know, I've, I've worked really hard in, in COVID to try to keep myself inspired and to try mm -hmm. to keep students inspired. And that's yeah. where these masterclasses Genesis was. Mm. When you talk about trusting the process, you know, with, with all of my students that are here, the reason that I am so careful with y'all and the reason that we work so hard on the things that come from Vermeulen and Clevenger and Farkas is so that you can trust the process. Mm -hmm. So the process <laughs> is what Danielle and David and Joe and Alex, we are all leaves on the same tree. Yeah. And if you do those things, you can definitely trust the process. And you know, that's what Bill said to me in my first lesson was, man, you're experiment number 1,375 <laughs> for me. And if you do this stuff, you, there's 1,374 people who have made it before you, man, just <laughs> Just do it and you'll make it. Yeah, it's true. It's really true. And that, that experience studying with, with Bill was a major change for me, you know, trusting. And that was where I came up, where I started thinking that way, trusting the process, believing that it was going to work. And then it did. And now I can look back and tell everyone like, hey, if you actually do this fundamental practice, you actually get better. Crazy. I know because I did it and it worked. <laughs> Will you want to listen to some hornplay? Yeah, sure. All right, uh, Argus, you wanna you wanna jump in here? Are you gonna play the third horn recap from Till? I can do whatever, man. Okay, well, I'm gonna let you and Danielle have fun, and I'm gonna get out of here. So uh, y'all y'all enjoy yourself. All right. Hey, Miss Coleman, right, nice let's... to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you as well. So you're gonna play. Something from Till. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it's Great. the opening, uh, well, the recap for the okay. third horn, I guess, on it. So. Great. Yeah, let's hear it. Nice. That, nice. Was great. that was great. Good job. Oh, dude. Nice job. It's especially like, you know, hopefully you've been like noodling a little bit on mute while I was talking, <laughs> not just having to do that cold. But, but if you did, bravo. Um, it's great. It's, it's hard over the Zoom because I can't hear as well, like the tone, you know, as well as I'd like to. But um, it was really good. I, I think when you're playing something like this excerpt, the the and well i can say this more generally i think with all horn playing in audition setting and that could be any audition any time a horn play horn player is playing by themselves i think the number one thing we need to focus on is portraying a sense of control and um What's the word I, that I always go to that's somehow escaped me? But a sense of stability. That's what I wanted to say. Um, and I loved your playing because it had so much flair and life in it, which was awesome. Like, that is what we need. When you're playing by yourself, it still needs to kind of be a bit more in the box, like a little bit more um, stable. So there was a little bit of variation, like rhythmically, you know, things like that. Like the time felt a little like I wasn't quite 
it, it wasn't quite in the pocket perfectly. So um, rhythm is like the one thing that we really can't uh, have any, we can't mess with it. It's like gotta be, when you're playing by yourself, it has to be very steady. So mm -hmm. for this one, I think like maybe even shaving just like the slightest bit off the tempo and giving me a little more um, heft on the notes that you're passing by. So all the long notes were awesome and had this great, you know, nice bright clarity. If we can get the same clarity from the very opening of each of those statements, the ones that come off the offbeat, ba -ba 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 -da, ba -ba -ba -ba. and so it, it kind of like you danced over the ba -ba 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 -da 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 -da, and then I heard it mm -hmm. at the end. What I want to hear is like, I want to feel that downbeat that I'm not hearing. So ba -ba 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 -da, ba -ba 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 -ba, like just a little more, maybe it's length, tone. I like to think when I'm playing fast notes like that, I like to think of them as tones instead of notes. I'm thinking a little bit more about giving each note a little bit more sound and maybe just a slight bit more length. So you fill each tone up. So you're really kind of like feeling, feeling the pulse and feeling each tone. So maybe play it one more time. Um, and on those smaller notes, I want you to see if you can give me a little bit more heft like dig into the tone of those notes a little bit more and really feel the rhythm before you start and in the rest in between sometimes when we're playing alone like if there's a rest we feel awkward because nothing's happening but we have to just be so in the music like we're just in it and that's that so this audition they have x out the five and the six on those yeah. bars they have him just taken one okay yeah that makes sense yeah, so play one more time. Really, like, before you start, I want you to give yourself, like, a tempo, at least a few bars in your head, and breathe in tempo and kind of, like, live in that tempo and really feel those beats and give me more tone, tones on those fast free notes. So do it one more time for us. Yes, that was nice i i felt that as you were playing it you were experimenting with that and working on it throughout and and it got better and better as you went so that was really good um can I that ask was a question? I'm sorry to butt in. Yeah, sure. What's sure. different about that last one up to high C that you're so nails on, <laughs> but the two previous, they don't have that same justo that that one has. What's up with that? I don't know. Maybe it's because like, hmm, I'm like more excited. I don't, I don't know. It's just... <laughs> I love because I mean everybody who doesn't love the way that last one sounded. I mean, holy, Amazing. holy! Can can you do it again for us? And then can you see if you can feel like that from the very beginning? It's more about intensity of the music inside you, man. See if yeah. you can shoot it out at us a little bit more. I have I have a suspicion that the reason the last one feels like that is because one you're prepping for a high note so you're giving yourself probably more air pressure so i yeah. think that and and in the lower register especially the mid register it's a little bit harder to to create the same amount of compression and air pressure behind each note mm -hmm. it's easier when you get up higher and when you're sort of leading up to the high note like you're probably sub or unconsciously doing that so maybe trying to create a little bit more pressure behind the yeah, da, 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 you know, or on those lower mm -hmm. ones. And maybe okay. just start after the first call, like skip the first, the first bar is fine. Just start on the ba, 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 ba. The, ba, 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 ba. Okay. Yeah, start on that, on that thing. And see if you can get that same intensity, that's the word, of, with your air pressure. Yes, ma'am. <sighs>
that was really that was nice. Really yeah. Nice. I would, I would challenge you as well. I think you need to sing this one. And like, I bet if I asked you to sing it really slowly, like I'm not totally convinced that you would be able to sing it perfectly. This is one I have sung many, many times to really get, because everyone is a little different and you have to be so familiar with, you know, like all the different intervals. So I would say sing it very slowly and then play it very slowly so that it's that much more internalized. And, but that was already way better, you know. Um, air pressure is so important in compression. And as a low horn player, I find myself talking about that a lot when I'm teaching because um, when you open the shape to make a lower note, we, mm -hmm. even, if you, even if your air was exactly the same, it wouldn't be enough because you created a larger space. So when you're up high, your tongue position is very high and you have very small space here. So it's easy to create air compression. When you go be and you get into that mid register, you're in this very open setting. So you have to create, think about how much more air it would take to create the same amount of pressure in that space. So right. that's what I, most people struggle with low playing is that they open up the space and the air, not only does the air not increase, it actually decreases. So that's why I think most people struggle with the, the lower stuff. So I would recommend to also practice some breath attack stuff in that range so that you're mm -hmm. feeling how you're starting the note with your air and not tonguing because the tonguing won't be enough, right? So practicing, thinking, bun, dun, 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 ha, like just practicing coming in on that first tone with just your air immediately will be a good practice of what that should feel like when you're articulating mm -hmm. it. If that makes sense. Now, when, yeah, when nice. you say like build up air compression, the lower, are you using a lot of abs as well? Oh yeah, that's like I use so much ab muscle when I'm playing, and I'm like very small, so I really ha I don't have any. Some people can breathe, and they have got some compression. I lose it pretty quickly. That natural compression, so. I'm, you, I'm really creating that compression. Anyone, I mean, and everyone's different. Even people who seem physically large might not have that. Um, but mm -hmm. that's a huge part of it. So whenever someone says support or compression, it's usually pushing the air using that upper ab muscle. So yeah, and, and when I play, it's like nonstop. Like I'm just like, like I'm just pushing. I'm mm -hmm. never gonna stop because if we tend to pull back in between notes, that pressure, and then we have to start all over with each note. So the, the Vermeil and Path philosophy is all about keeping the pressure up through each note change so that mm -hmm. the air is just there. And then it becomes right. really easy to play because the, the compression is just like, it's ready. Instead mm -hmm. of kind of stopping and starting and having the air um, sort of be questioning itself, if that makes sense. Yes, um, so yeah, compression. And, and, and part of that, I would say, I can't totally hear perfectly but I would guess that maybe there's a little too much tonguing in relation to the air so my other mantra is more air less tongue it fixes almost every problem <laughs> because you don't need the tongue to create sound it's right. just there to kind of organize so you have to kind of liberate yourself from our from articulation which can sometimes take over our air and prevent it from going smoothly so mm -hmm. lightening up the da -da 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 and, and, and thinking more about the, again, the tones rather than the notes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very big on a very light articulation all the time. Anytime I want like an accent or a crisp, I do that with my air and not with my tonguing. Wow, right. yeah, that is just really, really <laughs> solid advice, Argus. Um, yeah. Argus, let me ask you a quick question. The first one that begins on A below the staff, how many more reps do you have in the second two than that one? Do you feel like you've avoided that lick at all or have you passed by it mentally or, or have you really, have you really put the muscle memory down on that? Well, I mean, like when I first got this A2, that was like one of the things that um, I like tried to play, but like the part where it goes from the C E G to the G sharp, like my fingers, I couldn't really get that um, until I started really playing it a lot. Um, so, I mean, I feel like in the beginning when I first picked it up, I was probably neglecting that phrase a bit. So I probably need to work it over quite a bit. Um, you know, just like I Gail mean, Williams, man, you got to slur it, legato tongue it, and then as is with the Met, under tempo, under volume. 
So, yeah, I would eight. say too, I, I was just saying this to, to, I did a class on Saturday with some of the youth orchestra members. And I told, I suggested that someone slur something. And then I had to make sure I qualify because I think there's a certain, for me, the, a certain type of slur that's a little bit different. So instead of just not tonguing and sort of playing slurred, when I'm, when I'm practicing something slurred, I'm like, I'm going like all out connection. So I'm like, duh. Like, yeah. Not just you're like, like, you're like not half just ripping tongue. through that. Yeah. yeah. Like just like when I'm slurring, I'm really focusing on like that. My air is just like every note is 100% connected to the rest. So actually I would love for you to just try that just on that, try that first lick slurred. Mm -hmm. And I want you to just see how like huge and relentless you can make your air as you play that. Mm -hmm. Just that first thing. And, and to humor me, like don't even start with articulation, just start with air attack. Ha, like that. It could even be more. And, and I, it, was, it was interesting that it wanted to kind of start lower, but that was good because you were like open, you know? That even tells me that when you're setting up to articulate that note, there's probably a little extra tension that doesn't need to be there. And when you release that, it actually opens yourself up even more. So do it one more time and even like push through every note, like just move, 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 and never let yourself stop. Okay. Same thing. Yeah, good. And you could probably feel when you wanted to pull back. Yeah. And so like kind of working on pushing past that instinct is that's like where the practice is. Yeah. That's like where the changing how you're thinking about it is happening. Yeah. That's, that's that. <laughs> Bro, she's just giving you those big <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. That is where the practicing is. It's it's can you trick more tricking your mind, by the way. Absolutely. Can you trick your mind <laughs> to push when you feel resistance and not pull. Yes. It's yes. Smart. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Now I had a question. Um, since we're doing low, low stuff, on the second um horn on Beethoven, Symphony Third, bump yep. bomb, like how do you like I still have issues with that and I've I've taken lessons with Bill. I probably need to go back like look at my recording should probably do that today uh but like bum bum like getting that note to be present because like yeah. when i try to do that it's like it, it's there but it's like really uh it's like it sounds nasty it doesn't have like the resonance you want i imagine mm -hmm. i i know that feeling well so i would say 100 percent practice breath attack because mm -hmm usually sometimes in that register and lower our tongue is not in the appropriate spot we tend to articulate mm -hmm. in the wrong register um your articulation really should change from high to low the the consonant of your articulation and where it's touching and all those things um that's a big part of it so practice breath attack i for me i have practiced that excerpt many a time um and i practice and i've played it many times as well and, and um i always do a lot of breath attack long tones on that pitch mm -hmm. finding like the the least tension setup for that note um so just try it now just play that b flat non-tongue just a long tone and i want you to see if you can relax like back of the tongue throat and and how you can create the resonance with that compression, the ab muscle, the air, and see mm -hmm. how relaxed it can be up here. So just try that. Just, just a long tone on that B flat. So give me more air, like really fill it up. Yeah, that's nice. So, so now like to practice that excerpt, and I have done this so many times, practicing the whole thing breath attacked. So ha 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 and really like trying to get trying to because that's how you build that muscle memory of those arpeggios. And and it's also just like you're again, you're just like releasing yourself from the prison of articulation. Like just 
finding how to create each of those tones with the right shape and building that muscle memory a lot, not just playing one long tone and doing it once and then playing it again the other way. You have to really like do the exercise enough that, that and then slowly transition into playing the excerpt itself. Um, so I would then from just the long tone, once you find a nice balance of resonance, then I would practice ha uh, ha uh, doing it twice. So try that once, just ho uh, ho, uh, sort of like that. Same fullness, same resonance. So you'll find, you'll hear already that the, the you know, the sh there's some tension that's preventing the air from moving freely. So you have to sort of in investigate that. So here's where the practice is, is, okay, listen, I, I, you did that beautiful resonant long tone. Then when you switch to this other exercise, the tone was different. It was no longer the quality right. tone, which is a big Vermeulen thing. So you have to go back to the long tone and just keep working on that till you build enough of that sort of muscle memory um, that you can then create that a little faster and, and mm -hmm. maybe twice in a row. And then you're getting closer and closer to be able to, to playing bum pom and you've got the fullness, the immediacy of the air, the resonance, the perfect efficient shape, all those wonderful things. I will say some, sometimes I think your breath to me sounds like a little, like there may be some tension building even in the breath itself. So mm -hmm. when I breathe, I try to think of my mouth as being like a little more like this. And so I don't want to have any of this or, mm -hmm. or this. I want, I want openness all through here. And actually on this register, it's great. That's a little harder when you're about to like come in on a high C and you're like, <laughs> so down here, it's good. Right. So really thinking about the, even like mirroring that register you're about to create will help. And I try to keep this tension free when I'm breathing. I try to keep it tension free most of the time, actually. Um, I use my muscles, muscle engagement, you know, for your embouchure, but this should all feel very relaxed. And to me, Can visualizing visualize that as I breathe helps me hmm. to keep it more. Yeah. You know, Argus, when you try to reduce that tension there, I, I love that Eli Epstein idea of oh. finding that, that air whistle and just how can I weed all the tension out of that air whistle on the right pitch mm -hmm. and then put it on the horn and it's going to be loud, you know? Yeah. <laughs> impossible, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then it's always good to, to go loud and then come back. <laughs> so right about your breath, man. I mean, you, you gotta, you gotta practice that inhale enough shots. Mm -hmm. where there's no tension there either. And, I love that's where the practice is. Y'all are going to hear that out of my mouth a lot. <laughs> that's good though. But, but that's really like, those are easy things to fix. You know, like you sound great and it's not like, you know, like these are just things. It's just a matter of allowing yourself sort of the, the slowing down. And, and it's sometimes it's frustrating to be like, wow, I'm really practicing one note, you know, but that's what I do. <laughs> right. I'm a yeah. great player, but I, I'm practicing one note, you know, like that's how I practice and that's how I maintain my level of playing is by the most basic fundamental exercises. So I think sometimes it feels maybe like really like this many steps back, but like that is when I went to Rice and, and I basically started over, like I was, it was weird. Like I was already good and could play the horn, but I pretty much started over and I was doing so basic of exercises. And, and it was hard, but it was so good. It was good to also just release myself from that mentally and be like, oh, this is really good practice. This isn't like basic stuff that I'm done with. Like this is, this is the practice. <laughs> right. Long right, tone. Great job, man. Great yeah, job. Yeah, really nice. Just keep it up, right? You got what? You got till the 10th on this recording? Yep, six days. Oh yeah, that's great. And Not the thing all is, like, the time, brother. You're probably like, so technically proficient at this stuff I would really focus at least for the next few days on just some really fundamental stuff like working on breathing long tones just getting that compression and then then go back you know like maybe just you know you don't need to play through those excerpts for the next couple of days like you know them already so work mm -hmm. on some of that fundamental stuff and then see if you can 
that stuff will be there when you go back to play the excerpts a few days from now and it'll be that right. much better. It kind of just gives you a little bit of a break from the habits. Like it's so mm -hmm. funny you play Till because Till is something I've struggled so much to change because it was one of the first excerpts I learned. I was like 15 or 16. And no matter how much good fundamental work I do, when I play Till, I just go right back to how I played it when I was 16. <laughs> like, I know I'm better. Why, why, you know, but it's, there's some habits there and I have to work really hard to relearn the excerpt, you know, from what I have learned before. So yeah, I would say, I would recommend to take a little bit of space and really focus on some, some healthy fundamentals. Yeah, it would be really good. All right, awesome. awesome. Elijah, uh, let's get you in here, man. I, I have to go at 11.30, so. Okay, well, yeah, let's then, do Elijah good. quickly, and then we Great. will, um, and then we'll, I'll, we'll just have a couple wrap-up questions, and we'll get out of here. Great. Uh, what are you playing, Elijah? Um, I'm just going to play the first half of the supplemental A2. Uh, oh, edition. perfect. Yeah, perfect. Oh, <laughs> stop all that no that was great it was funny because you did the classic thing where one thing went wrong and then you were like ah panic and stop so one thing to remember is that uh, and this is very important when you're practicing for a performance and this video is going to be a performance um when you're practicing for that you have to practice performance mode because if you a lot of people play through you sound like you're very naturally talented when you play through something and most of it goes pretty well and something goes wrong and that's and you stop and fix then you're gonna get in that habit right so you have to also practice performance mode where you don't stop put the metronome on and say i'm not stopping for anything doesn't matter what happens you have to learn how to move past the the little not mishaps but things that go differently than what you intended which is how i like to say that um when those things happen that you can move past them and move on and continue to play great um, what I loved the most was you got a huge, big, beautiful sound and, and lots of air, which was awesome. Um, but there were some spots where I lost that. And that was mostly in when it went lower. So the, the high stuff would always pop out lots of air, lots of compression. This is what I was saying before to Argus that you, you know, it's easy to create and it's very natural to create that compression on the high in the high range it's less natural to create the same compression in the low range. So when you're playing something like that, where it went like, ba -da -da -da, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, it's going to sound awkward because the high notes are going to pop out too loud. So you have to play the lower notes. Like you have to intend to play them fuller so that it actually sounds balanced to the high notes. Because you can hear the higher notes better anyway, just because of physics. So you have to always kind of be balancing that to make it sound even. Um, so I would say that we keep thinking about some creating compression to make that balance between the mid stuff and the high. And the more technical it got, the more I felt your airplane back. And that is so common as like everyone, uh, including me. And so that's something that I mentally have practiced so much that I don't do it. Um, but I, I often say about horn, what I have learned about it is that a lot of the time it can be very counterintuitive. So, so the things that we might naturally reactively do are actually the wrong things to do. Like something is hard and we, we shy away from it. We pull our air back 
trails, people always pull their air back through trails. And I don't know why we do that. We always do. Little notes, bum, 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 bum. those little notes we pull back. Those are the parts we need to push into the most. So just knowing that and knowing, okay, if I have a technical thing, I need to isolate it and I need to practice pushing my air across it. And I would say exactly the same exercise that Argus did, that you take that little technical mid-range moment and just like blast slur your way through it. <laughs> Not blast in the sense of like breaking up your tone, but just pushing really constant, consistent air through a slur to teach yourself to play it that, that with that kind of support and compression. Because the natural thing you're doing is to back away. So you need to retrain yourself how to approach it. Um, that's what I would say for that. And, and you know, it got less um, consistent when it got more harmonically complicated. So I think you need to take that less obvious, harmonically obvious part and really sing through that. Make sure you, Make really, sure know you really know those arpeggios the intervals, the relationships, so that you know exactly where you're headed. Couple that with the intentional work on, you know, some of those counterintuitive horn moments, and it'll be awesome. It sounds really good. It's really good, Elijah. I'm sorry we ran a little long on you, but, you know, you, you'll get plenty of chances to play. We have another seven more guests over the next four or five <laughs> weeks, so... Um, and I can be everybody, a little late to the next thing. We don't have to like cut off right now, but. Right, well, can everybody turn their cameras on um, so we can take a picture? Aw. And Good we can say I hi to everybody, me. shout some people out. Laksh Gulati, Suhas, Ishwar Parasaramani, there's Max, Max Robichaux, there's Sibi, there's Carolina, all the way from Germany joining us. Woo! Um, fantastic. Again, I say this every week, you folks represent my best and my brightest. Y'all give me as much juice as I try to give y'all. The fact that you're here hanging with me and Danielle on a Monday afternoon, that's the difference, you know? <laughs> you think your competition's doing this, they're probably not. Nope. Um, <laughs> take a picture. <laughs> okay, let me get a horn in the picture. Yeah, get a horn in there. <laughs> Boom. Okay, so we like to wrap up with just a little bit of Desert Island. Um, <laughs> so first, um, can you tell us quickly what your equipment is? What horn and what mouthpiece do you play on every day? Um, I play a Dieter Auto horn, which is the Genghis Barbie sponsored horn. Um, this is, uh, I have two horns. I have the Barbie horn and then I have this, which is the Hudson Valley model, Dieter Auto. It's very beautiful. It's got these all, nice- All hats. yellow grass, it looks like. Yeah, it's really nice. It's got these, uh, it's just a beautiful horn. And I play a Moosewood, Bill Vermeulen Moosewood, um, which I am obsessed with. It's funny because it's very small. It's a B16 and I play low horn, but somehow it works. So I'm not really sure how that's possible. But yeah, that's my horn. I love it. Okay, so you're trapped on a desert island. You get to take one composer's whole catalog. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's got to be Strauss. It's got to be Strauss. Okay, love it. Um, is there a specific recording that you would recommend to these students? I always, as an example, uh, Giolini in America, CSO, Mahler 9. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I am not that great at like specific recordings, but there's a, there's a CSO Chike 5 from like the early 80s, and it's like unbelievable Chike 5 horn solo. So I'd, I'd probably have to go with that. That or um, like maybe eight years ago, Minnesota Orchestra put out a Sibelius cycle, yeah. and they are the, the five and seven album got worn out on my digital playlist <laughs> Wow, so good minnesota orchestra is i think one of the most undervalued organizations in yeah. america they're, really so they're so and good and they're like the nicest big, big yeah they're like on. they're the nicest people like they're so nice <laughs> okay so the last thing here it, we've talked about so much is you have a lot of, of younger folks here. Obviously, these are not college people at conservatory, which is probably what you're used to these days, a lot of. If you could rewind and go back 
to being in sixth or seventh grade, what's the golden nugget that you would pass <laughs> on to yourself? Oh, that's so It's funny because actually my students that I work with privately are all middle school. I, I oh, only good. teach young students, which is funny. Um, a lot of the things that I would tell my younger self are things that people were telling me. <laughs> and sometimes it takes a long time. You know, I remember people telling me to breathe more and use more air for years. And I'm like, and I tell it to my students and I'm like, why aren't they just immediately doing it? I'm telling them. And then I realized, oh, people said that to me for like eight years before I did it. Um, right. So some of that is just, I think, to really listen to what the advice that you're getting and try to think of it as often as you can. When I was younger, I think I would hear a piece of advice and, and then just keep on doing the same thing. So I think like as much as you can ponder those pieces of advice and really try to just like, even if it's just once a day that you think of it, that's one more time a day than, than otherwise. So um, I think that's, I mean, I, and as I said, more air, <laughs> that's more air. big more air like you always need to be be maximizing your amount of air and realizing that air is everything every sound you make every crescendo every dynamic every articulation is all being created by air so it's very important to harness your air and connect to your breath and take big breaths <laughs> wow danielle i can't thank you enough for your time I, thank Anna. you what an opportunity and uh this will this will go up on the youtube uh later today and uh wow, if you awesome. wanna just email me any of the linking that you want included in there sure. i will we'll take care of all that um thanks again if you you know like i said if you want to join in for anyone else we've had some professional guests hang out the last couple of weeks as well and I'll try to keep you up to date for everybody that's coming that's in. That's really cool. Days. Say hello to, to everyone you have on the show. On the show. <laughs> the show. It is feels the like show. that. Now. It Mark does. Show. <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh man. Well, this thank, has been you, everyone. thank you so much. Everybody, thank, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. For playing. Thank, thank you to the students who played. Awesome. Hey, thank you. We'll uh we'll connect again soon, hopefully. Okay. Have Thanks a great again. one. Bye. Bye-bye.